Hill family in attendance again. Um, for those of you that have joined the department since we had the last Hill lecture, let me just fill you in a little bit and tell you that Stan Hill was a professor here in the department. He was the first member of the astrophysics group. And he studied um, planetary astronomy, um, did things like predict volcanism on Jupiter's moon Eo. And we started this lecture series as a way to, to once a year kind of celebrate some of Stan's past scientific work and keep that legacy alive in the department. Um, some of the past speakers, um, well, all the, the four previous speakers were all close collaborators of Stan. And there was a real personal touch that way. Um, this year's speaker, Stephen Kane, I don't think ever actually collaborated with Stan, but I think you'll see how his work has very much been influenced by Stan's work. So we're seeing the, the larger impact of it. Um, like Stan, Stephen is at home in a Department of Earth and Planetary Science at UC Riverside, but is also a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy there. Um, you got your PhD, I believe, at the University of Tasmania, and migrated eventually to California to join the NASA um, Exoplanet Science Institute, okay, in Pasadena, and joined the faculty at UC Riverside in 2017. That's right. So I think um, we're going to hear a delightful talk today about the evolution of planetary habitability, which is planetary habitability is the title of a book that Stephen wrote during the, the pandemic that you should all take a look at. And you know I think one of the things that strikes me about this about Stephen's work in, in general is that, he, he's used pretty much every observational technique out there, okay, to go study exoplanets. That is, to find planets around stars other than our sun. But he's also an expert on the solar system. And I think what's novel about his work is he puts those two things together to learn from all the detail in the, the solar system to gain some insight about the habitability of exoplanets in general, I think, that we might not otherwise have. So it's a real delight to hear from Stephen today, and I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming on. Yeah. You're muted on the Zoom. How's that? Good. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> that would be rather weird and awkward if only there was a vacation. Jim um, online. Oh, can I have one request? Uh, is it possible to switch those? Lights up, it might be easier. We will work on it. Why don't you go to the order? I'll probably have screens going up and down and everything. Crystal, it's the one over by the door. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So, as I said, thank you so much, everyone, for coming along, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak with you. It's, it's quite an honor. Uh, so, uh, as Crystal was mentioning in her introduction, I've had quite a diverse pathway uh, to, to get here, and I've been um, working on uh, exoplanets, uh, which I largely characterize as stellar astrophysics, uh, and planetary science in working with solar system uh, data and trying to combine those two together and, and see what we can learn out of the combination of those two. In particular, over the past 15 years or so, I've been focusing a lot of my efforts on uh, something called planetary uh, habitability, uh, which is a topic that uh, nobody really knows what it is. Uh, and uh, if you read my book, you'll discover that I don't really know what it is. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I wanted to uh, start out by just telling you a little bit more about uh, myself. If my remote is going to work. There we go. Um, so uh, I am from Outback, Australia. Uh, and I grew up as a teenager during the 80s. And so one of the uh, major events that inspired me was going to this planetarium. If you're wondering what a planetarium in Outback Australia looks like during the 80s, it looks like that. <laughs> And it is in a sheep paddock. There are sheep out in the field of view. It was a giant orrery of the solar system, 
Uh, and it was just something that really captured my imagination. There were no digital projectors or anything like that. It was a, a, a model of the solar system. But what was really fascinating me at that time as well during the 80s was the Voyager spacecraft. So this is showing the trajectory of uh, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft as they were doing their tour of duty in the outer solar system. And in particular, the encounter of Voyager 2 with Uranus and, uh, and Neptune, uh, Uranus in 1986, Neptune in 1989, uh, was an enormous inspiration to me and what really uh, got me into planetary science. And uh, if you can imagine in uh, 1986, so I was about 12 years old and I was watching on the TV in Outback Australia this animation which was produced by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory using images that were being received uh, by, by Voyager. And so when uh, I went to university, I, what I really wanted to do was planetary science and uh, I, I was very fortunate because I started grad school in 1996, beginning of 96, and that was a key time when exoplanets uh, was really burgeoning as a field. This was in the wake of the discovery of 51 Peg B, and so there was uh, opportunities coming up to actually pursue exoplanets in grad school, which hadn't been available uh, before. And so uh, what I uh, got involved in at the time was this topic of gravitational microlensing. And so I spent the next five years looking for planets using this uh, technique where you have a foreground star passing in front of a background star and the change in brightness of the background star can produce a signature of a planet which is already in the foreground star. It's a very, very clever technique, requires a lot of observational resources, which is why I did my PhD at the University of Tasmania, because they had dedicated access to a one meter telescope, which was part of a global network uh, at that time. And so there's me in uh, 1999, busily writing my, my, my thesis, which was uh, all about microlensing. But I was also very fortunate that there were other people who were working on this at the time, in particular Stan was, became preoccupied with microlensing, apparently based on his publication record, uh, during the, the uh, 90s and into the 2000s. And he was calculating um, the expected rate of microlensing discoveries, and this had a huge influence on me, and, and, and microlensing is theoretically complex, and I was fortunate to have people like Stan who I could reach out to and ask for help in this, in this uh, period. Um, and he was very generous with his time and explained these, uh, these things to me. So it's something for which I've been uh, incredibly grateful uh, to Stan and his legacy in the diverse amount of work that he did and for me, as I said, during this time. Uh, so uh, what I want to do now is uh, go back even further in time uh, to talk more generally about this whole topic of looking for planets around other stars, how that ties into planetary habitability and what the next steps going forward are. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to go back quite a ways in time uh, to the time of Giordano Bruno, who was one of the uh, innovative thinkers of his time, and he had this really amazing uh, quote, uh, particularly for this time, uh, where he said, there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. And I always like to stop here and ask people to have a, have a guess what he's talking about there, because he's talking about Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uranus and Neptune had not been discovered at that point that required the use of the telescope. So the question is, what is planet number seven? Does anybody have any other ideas? The moon. The moon. The moon. Oh, the, moon. The, the, the moon. This is around the time of the Copernican revolution from the geocentric to the heliocentric view of the universe, and so he was talking about the moon when he spoke about the seven planets. 
He says, we see only the suns because they are the largest bodies and the luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they are small and non-luminous. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. You would correctly guess that the last sentence is the kind of thing that got him into trouble. I can stand here before you now and speak freely about the prospect of life on other planets, but there have been various periods of history when I would be doing so at the risk of my own life. Jordan and Bruno was living during one of those periods. But it's the middle sentence that I actually want to draw your attention to because Jordan identified the major problem in finding planets around other stars, or one of the major uh, problems. And I know that there is this uh, department is very, very active in the area of direct imaging. And so you know exactly what I'm talking about, which is that we're trying to find a faint object next to a very, very bright object. And so he identified way back then that these planets are invisible and that plagued the hunt for planets around other stars for many, many years, centuries in fact. And so it's one of these areas where I always say that exoplanets is a concept where technology had to catch up to ideas, which is what we've witnessed over the past several decades. So there are numerous ways we can solve this, and one of the ways in, is which we can say, okay, if we can't directly see them easily, then let's try indirect methods. And so rather than uh, directly see the planets, we'll infer their existence by monitoring the stars very closely. And this is why I often uh, point out that the whole field of exoplanets uh, is predominantly stellar astrophysics, because it's been inherit inheriting techniques which folks who have been looking at eclipsing binary stars uh, for many years, those techniques that they've been using, just to different mass and size ratios. And those are predominantly the radial velocity and the transit techniques. And so we have the gravitational effect of the planet orbiting the star, which causes a radial motion towards and away from us. And then the bottom uh, transit technique where the planet passes in front of the star and temporarily blocks out some of the light. I'm sure that many of you are, are familiar with, uh, with these techniques and have seen them demonstrated before. And of course, we've, uh, we've been using various large telescopes, most particularly the UC access to Keck has been enormously useful in measuring the radial velocity effect of the discovery of hundreds of planets using that technique. But this transit method, measuring the brightness of stars to high precision, is very, very difficult to do from the ground, not just because of the day-night cycle, but we're looking through the Earth's atmosphere, of course, as astronomers would often want to remove the Earth's atmosphere, which is why astronomers shouldn't be in charge of too much. Uh, so, uh, so th especially when we're looking uh, for uh, planets which are the size of the Earth around a solar type star, then we're looking at something like 10 to the minus 5 effects, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. And so, uh, what we did back in 2009 was we designed an experiment that was specifically for the discovery of planets the size of the Earth around solar type stars. Uh, and was able to stare at a patch of sky for uh, about three to five years. It ended up being about three and a half years for the primary mission, but it was deployed not in a low Earth orbit, but to an Earth trailing orbit, so it could stare at a patch of the sky in Cygnus, which contained about 170,000 stars uh, during that period. Uh, it was enormously successful, and, uh, and, and taught us a lot about planetary statistics because after all this was a statistical mission trying to uh, teach us about how common planets like the Earth uh, might be. So uh, this is uh, one of the primary uh, plots that is used to encapsulate the results of the Kepler mission. And uh, one of the main things that we learned from this uh, is that the size distribution is increasing uh, from the top left down to the bottom right. So that's telling us that the first kinds of planets that we found, which were the hot Jupiters, those are the easiest to find, but it doesn't mean they're the most common. In fact, they're relatively rare. And in fact, we see in general that the larger planets, the size of Jupiter, 
are relatively rare compared to their terrestrial counterparts. And so once we head down in this direction, uh, the density of points increases until we had hit the detection threshold of the Kepler mission. Uh, so this was, in my mind, uh, the key result from Kepler, telling us that terrestrial planets are relatively common. And of course, this is great news for astrobiology, for planetary habitability, with the, now the knowledge that the seeing terrestrial planet formation is a natural consequence of star formation. Good thing to know, but uh, one of the issues with the uh, follow-up of the Kepler planets is that they tended to orbit relatively bright stars. And that's why in recent years we've transitioned to a new mission uh, which is called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And uh, that was launched uh, 2018, as I recall. I went to the uh, launch out at, uh, at Cape Canaveral. And the purpose of TESS is to, rather than stare at a relatively small part of the sky, uh, TESS has a tile strategy where it has this wide field of view and it's in an Earth orbit, so it's anchored to the Earth as the Earth is orbiting the Sun. The consequence of that is that it means it can't stare continuously at one patch of sky like Kepler was able to. Instead, what it does is it observes a strip of the sky for about 30 days each, and then it moves on to the next strip, and it does that over the course of the, of the year. It does that for one hemisphere, and then after that year it flips over, and then it does the other hemisphere. And as I said, it was launched in 2018, and so it's uh, actually surveyed uh, the entire uh, sky, or most of, of the sky, uh, several times, uh, both the North and the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and we're well into the extended mission component. The great news about uh, this kind of a mission as opposed to Kepler is that the planets tend to orbit bright stars. That means a lot of signal to noise in being able to do things like measure the masses from the radial velocity method, which is great. Um, but it also means that we can pursue things like atmospheric characterization, uh, which is what's coming uh, next. And I'm sure all of you were wide awake at about 4 a.m. On, on, uh, on Christmas morning uh, because that's when the James Webb Space Telescope uh, was, was launched. I knew that it would uh, be much harder for me to get up for that rather than just stay up late. So I just stayed up playing video games until, until the telescope launched. It went absolutely spectacularly well. Um, it's, it was one of the most nerve-wracking moments in, 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 uh, in my memory of, of mission uh, deployment because there's so many single points of failure as this telescope deploys. And you can see, for example, the way in which the, the sun shield uh, is being unfurled, which was just held under tension as it was uh, on its way out about a million miles from Earth to the Lagrange point. Uh, where it's going to be parked. But incredibly, every, everything went perfectly, uh, as far as we can tell, because um, uh, we've received uh, uh, first light images from James Webb, and everything seems to be great. Uh, the uh, initial lifetime of the mission was projected to be about five years, but then uh, needed so few course corrections to get the Lagrange point that that's been upgraded to about 10 years. So. Uh, so the James Webb is going to be a, a really fantastic facility for us to be able to measure planetary atmospheres. How is it going to be doing uh, that? Well, that's the beauty of transiting planets, those planets that pass in front of their stars, because as a planet passes between us and the star, uh, then it means that the light from the star is passing through the limb of the atmosphere of the, of the planet on its way to us. Uh, and as it does so, uh, the absorption features uh, that we see in the, in the resulting spectrum will depend on the composition of the atmosphere. And so this is why the community is so excited, it's why so much of the, of the cycle one James Webb time has been allocated to see exactly what we'll, what we will be able to uh, do with these data. Uh, 
What will we be able to do with these data? Well, this is where it starts to, uh, to become complicated because ideally what we're trying to do is look for signs of life, habitability, the kinds of features that we see in the spectrum of the Earth. And so uh, this is a, a basic cartoon model of what a spectrum of the Earth would look like. And we've got these distinctive features in, in, in here. We've got uh, oxygen and uh, ozone, which in the case of, of the Earth's uh, atmosphere has been largely the result of biological processes occurring at the surface. And we've got of course, carbon dioxide, and there's been outgassing that has occurred throughout uh, Earth's history, uh, even uh, methane. And there are some combinations of these which may be considered a biosignature. Of course, we need to be careful because there are uh, what we call abiotic processes, which can also lead to some of these individually. And so we often talk about combinations of some of these, uh, which could be feasibly interpreted as a biosignature. But I want to uh, uh, draw your attention to this one down here, water vapor, uh, where it says suggest habitability. And uh, this is quite the nefarious term. As I mentioned at the beginning, when I recently wrote that book about planetary habitability, I had to have a whole bunch of disclaimers uh, uh, in there about this is, this is what it could mean, but here's some other processes that could lead to similar kinds of signatures. And when we're talking about water vapor, once again, we need to be uh, very careful. But why do we care about water so much? What is a simple way in which we could talk about planetary habitability in a context that would allow us to create a framework that we could quantify uh, what is going on on the surface of the planet? Well, water uh, has been a significant part uh, of Earth's history. Uh, as Crystal mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, I'm in an Earth and Planetary Sciences Department and a Physics and Astronomy Department. Prior uh, to my arriving at UC Riverside five years ago, I, I'd always uh, been in, in astronomy groups. Uh, but it's, it's wonderful to be with, uh, with Earth scientists who constantly remind me that one of the most amazing things about Earth is that it has had surface liquid water for a for almost its entire history. You think, okay, well that's kind of cool, but uh, you know, is that really? It, well, it means that a fairly narrow temperature range is being maintained over the large part of the surface. And when you think about that narrow temperature range, you start to realize, what, uh, how, how did it pull off this trick? And there's a lot of reasons um, how, the, uh, how the Earth has uh, managed to maintain this. Of course, there have been cycles uh, of of, uh, of ice ages and so on, but for the most part, has had surface of the water. So it's been important for the Earth, and we know that all life on Earth does require water. It is extremely common. We see that throughout the solar system, particularly the outer solar, solar system and beyond. And uh, one of the great things about water is being a natural solvent in which biochemical reactions can take place uh, is that it is liquid at a reasonably warm temperature. Because of course you can think of alternatives, uh, but, but usually they're in a liquid at much colder temperatures, which is generally going to slow down the biochemistry that's going to be taking place. So there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to like water. And so you could then say, okay, fine, let's look for the water, as, as uh, NASA likes to say sometimes, follow the water. What are, what are the factors that are going to allow for the presence of surface liquid water? Well, it's complicated. And this is where we, we try to uh, construct this framework that I mentioned earlier, which is essentially all of the various factors that are controlling the temperature at the surface of the planet. And this is a, uh, a figure which was produced by uh, Vicky Meadows and Rory Barnes at the Virtual Planet Laboratory, and they famously like to call it the planet's uh, hard diagram. In other words, this figure was more or less created to intimidate graduate students <laughs> into, into realizing the complexity of it, because the thing to remember uh, about all these various pieces on here is that many of them, in, uh, in fact most of them, are not independent 
Yeah, you can have draw lines connecting many of these, and it gets uh, complicated uh, very, very quickly. But it's divided into three major parts. Uh, and uh, there are various questions that are attached to each of these, which we're trying to go through and solve one by one. So for example, we can ask questions about what effect does stellar activity have on planetary atmospheres? That is a very active area of research at the moment, especially as most of the uh, uh, interest at the moment in exoplanets is for planets which are orbiting uh, very low mass stars. Uh, the reason is, is because stars closer to the planets are easier to find, and so they're more likely to be in the habitable zone, which is, uh, which is also relatively close to the star. How do different kinds of stars change as they become older? There's, there's all kinds of factors about the stars uh, that we can ask questions about. The, uh, the second part is the architecture of the planetary system itself. Uh, one of the main questions throughout exoplanets is, is the architecture of our solar system uh, normal? Uh, doesn't seem to me that our solar system has a normal architecture at all. There are various things to do with Jupiter, its placement, its evolution through time. Jupiter is more massive than the rest of the, of the, of the, uh, of the non-stellar bodies combined, and so it has had a profound effect on the architecture of the solar system. And it's not clear that many other systems do have a giant planet like Jupiter that remains beyond, beyond the snow line. So there's a lot of uh, questions about how important having something like Jupiter is and changing orbits through time. But perhaps uh, the, uh, the most details come out when we look at the planet itself. And that's when we can ask questions about how small can a planet be and still be habitable. Obviously when we look at Mars, which is half the size of the Earth, then we can get some inferences about that. Uh, what is the role of the magnetic field is something that people are looking at uh, uh, quite a lot. Can you have too much surface liquid water? For example, if you added liquid water to the Earth such that we didn't have continents, would that matter? Turns out it does. Uh, and you can actually make the planet uninhabitable by having too much water. But one of the um, main questions that I concern myself with is how do planetary surface conditions evolve through time. When we look at our solar system, and in particular when we look at our terrestrial planet inventory, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, we know what it looks like now, but what did it look like uh, one gig year ago and two gig years ago? How have these atmospheres changed through time? And um, it, we, we mostly think about planetary habitability in the context of the Earth. And uh, uh, the Earth scientists, like many of my colleagues at UC Riverside, study the evolution of Earth's atmosphere through time. Such that things such as the rise of oxygen and how the effect, of, uh, how life has uh, influenced the composition and evolution of Earth's atmosphere. And so, when we think about terrestrial planet uh, habitability and its evolution through time, we tend to think about Earth, but that's a single data point. And so. It, you can bemoan the fact that we're doing that and say, if only we had another example, if only we had another Earth-sized planet where we can look at what possible divergences could be. And this is where I think the universe is actually being extremely kind to us. Because it gave Earth a twin and it, it presented uh, uh, us with an opportunity to look at this in some detail. Uh, so far you've probably been wondering, wait a minute, I thought this was supposed to be a Venus talk. Where's Venus? Well, here we are. So, um, and so uh, Venus is a, a real golden opportunity uh, to look at the evolution of terrestrial planet uh, uh, evolution. And the reason I started studying Venus, by the way, was because uh, when I was working on, on the Kepler mission, and I was starting to think about it, as many people were, in 2008, 2009, as we were preparing for launch, and we knew what its purpose was, which was to find Earth's, Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars. But I realized, wait a minute, that's Venus. Uh, and it's, and uh, finding planets closer to their star 
uh, is something that the transit method is more attuned to do. And so what, uh, what Kepler would really tell us about would be the occurrence rate of planets like Venus. And, but then I, I, I realized we in the exoplanet community don't actually know anything about Venus. I mean, we're, for, on the one hand, we're stellar astronomers, so we don't know anything about planets at all. Um, and uh, and we, we keep, when we do talk about terrestrial planets, we tend to talk about the Earth. And so I started inviting myself to, to Venus meetings, um, uh, just showing up and giving talks about exoplanets and, and, uh, and integrating myself into the community that way about, about four years ago. Uh, here is a picture of, uh, of Venus from the Japanese spacecraft, Katsuki, which has been uh, uh, orbiting uh, Venus since 2010, being taken these beautiful images, largely in the ultraviolet, which is why you can see um, different cloud layers that you wouldn't normally see in optical wavelengths. Uh, now, when we uh, look at Venus, uh, it is obviously cloud covered, it's not obvious what's going on at the surface, but we now know that if we were to strip away the cloud layers, then we would see this. And so this is a construction of the topography of the surface, which is based largely upon the uh, NASA Magellan data uh, that was acquired in the, in the early 90s. Uh, and so we know that it is a desolate place. But this wasn't always known. Uh, and in fact, the obsession with Mars and life on Mars uh, dissipated uh, relatively quickly in the 20th century when, um, uh, when we were able to observe the surface uh, and, and, uh, and, and ascertain that there is relatively no activity or no activity at all going over the surface. That was not the case with Venus. And in fact, uh, you know, when you look at the, at the history of science fiction, which I always think is a really interesting litmus test as to where we are scientifically at the time, because science fiction tends to track the latest discoveries in science. And so when we look at science fiction history, we find that uh, as late as uh, 1959, there was a Three Stooges film, Have Rocket Will Travel, the Three Stooges Travel to Venus, and discovered there was a, there was a fire breathing tarantula or an invisible unicorn. I'm not kidding. Uh, and they talk to evil versions of themselves. It's a really weird movie, but you know, it's, it's three students. But the last depiction was in 1965, Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet. Uh, if you have a rainy Sunday afternoon, I advise you to watch it. The whole thing is available in its entirety on YouTube. Uh, so you don't need a subscription to a streaming service, you can go and watch it. And it's really interesting to see the ideas at the time, which for some reason a lot of the science fiction thought that we were going to go to Venus and find dinosaurs. I'm not sure why, but um, apparently they escaped the end of the Mesozoic era by going to Venus, who knew? But, uh, but that was the very last uh, depiction. What changed? 1960s was uh, an incredible time for Venus exploration because of this uh, science fiction uh, interest and a lot of people were, were, were interested in Venus and many people thought that there could be life on the surface of Venus. It was imagined as a, as a, as a tropical, hot, humid kind of environment. Uh, however, what changed was that the Americans and the Soviets were also trying to answer this question the Americans uh, had the Mariner programs that would, that would do flybys where they could get estimates of what the surface pressure was, at least down to a certain depth in the atmosphere, and started to quickly understand that this was not looking like a place where we're going to feasibly find dinosaurs, much less anything else. The Soviets, of course, had their famous Venera program, and they were firing uh, 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 pieces of, of metal at, at Venus at a, at a rather rapid rate and uh, well into the 80s and the Venera program uh, they uh, tended to launch things in pairs and the Venera 13 and 14 uh, uh, missions uh, landed on the surface of Venus in the early 19, uh, 1980s uh, Venera 13, the, depicted here, uh, it uh, was able to survive 
for about 57 minutes. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, so he survived for about 127 minutes at an atmospheric pressure of about 89 bars. Uh, its sister spacecraft, the Nero 14, had the misfortune of landing at a much lower altitude where the atmospheric pressure was about 94 bars uh, and it survived for 57 minutes. Uh, the temperature on the surface of Venus, the mean temperature, is remarkably consistent over the surface of around about 850 degrees Fahrenheit, which I recently discovered is the maximum temperature that uh, my barbecue can be preheated to. That's what the gauge goes up to. I don't know what happens beyond that. Uh, I don't know if I know. So, uh, so the, the surface conditions on Venus have been known for some time to be rather inhospitable. Now, uh, the problem is, how do we try to understand this? And how do we try to model this from a climate perspective such that this could give us predictive power for planets around other stars? Well, to demonstrate the scope of the problem, uh, one of my colleagues, Francois Fauget, who I consider to be one of the world's leaders uh, in uh, the modeling of climate. So Francois has uh, developed uh, various climate models from Earth-based models, and he has applied to various objects within our solar system. He has applied to Mars. He was part of the New Horizons mission, and uh, uh, his models was one of those which predicted the uh, collapse of the Plutonian atmosphere as it moved away uh, from uh, from uh, perihelion. Uh, so, sorry, perihelion. Uh, and here's what Francois Fourier had to say about the atmosphere of Venus when he has applied his models to it. Francois says that if Venus did not exist in our solar system, we would not dare to imagine it. And so, what he means by that is, if you could uh, humor me for a moment and just imagine a solar system without Venus. So just imagine that we have Mercury, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and the, that's all we've ever known. You could uh, start to picture how cavalier we would be about attributing planetary habitability to the size of the planet. We might say that, well, Mars is too small, and we, we would uh, I'll imagine that if we move the Earth a little bit closer, then things might warm up a bit, but we would not predict this because, uh, because the models of Francois and others, although we can start to model the current Venetian atmosphere, what we cannot do, struggle very much, is to model a transition from a temperate environment to uh, a post-runaway greenhouse state where we have such a large atmospheric mass that the surface can be considered a supercritical fluid of carbon dioxide. And so that is the challenge uh, that, is, that is facing us and, and the warning to us because the point in all of this is is that we didn't fully understand the surface conditions of Venus until we went there in the 60s. And that uh, even knowing what the conditions are on Venus now our models, our climate models, fail to predict it. This is a very serious warning for planets that are 50 light years away that we can't see. And from the uh, uh, transmission spectrum that we will be acquiring for a planet, an exoplanet from James Webb, which will be sampling the top of the atmosphere where the opacity allows us to get such data, then trying to infer that from a pressure temperature profile down to the surface is extremely difficult to do. And so this is why uh, I'm, I'm such a close adherence to this merging of planetary science, meaning solar system data, with the exoplanet data it necessitates uh, a collaboration between those two communities. And just to drive that point home, uh, when we look at the, uh, the atmospheric data inventory that we have available to us in our solar system, it is extremely limited. Remember that everything that, that we're doing for planets around other stars 
is based upon data that we acquire right here in our solar system. From those data, we construct models, and then those models we apply in a predictive fashion to planets that are orbiting other stars. So, what inventory do we have? Well, we of course we have Earth, which comprises about 1% of the total terrestrial atmospheric mass, uh, and even more than that is Titan. Mars has a uh, negligible uh, contribution. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, 0.6% uh, of the uh, of the Earth's atmospheric pressure at the surface, but the vast bulk of the uh, atmospheric mass is comprised in the Venetian uh, atmosphere. And of course, the, the big thing is that we that's that's the atmosphere that we understand least that contains most data, and we understand. The, the least about them. Uh, so one of the um, uh, issues is, of course, that Venus is in a post-runaway greenhouse state. I'm sure many of you have seen many diagrams like this, which is comparing uh, the energy balance of the Earth atmosphere to the Venetian atmosphere shown on the right. And uh, as I said, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, depicting about how much of the radiation that reaches the surface uh, is trapped uh, by the strong greenhouse absorption which is going on within the atmosphere. What is difficult to appreciate from this figure is that for the Earth, about 50% of the incident line at the top of the Earth's atmosphere is reaching the surface. For Venus, it's only about 3% is reaching the surface, which is rather counterintuitive. Venus receives about twice the solar constant at the top of the atmosphere, meaning twice the amount of energy that Earth receives from the Sun, but only 3% of that is reaching the surface, and so there's actually very little energy that's reaching the surface. Um, uh, much of it is being reflected by the clouds, but uh, a lot of it is being uh, deposited into the atmosphere. Uh, which makes the atmosphere of Venus extremely dynamic. Uh, the, uh, the atmosphere of Venus is uh, what we call a super-rotating atmosphere where there's an enormous uh, gradient of energy and movement as you move from the surface to the middle atmosphere and the upper layers. That's something that's very, very difficult for us to understand, but it's a consequence of the amount of energy that's been deposited uh, into that atmosphere. Now, Venus being in a uh, post runaway greenhouse state is something that we now take for, for granted as true, but as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I'm really obsessed with on this whole topic is uh, the evolution of planetary atmospheres with time. What we see now in our solar system is not necessarily what our planets look like uh, two billion years ago, three billion years ago, and we know this is true because we know it's true for the Earth. So, one of the common questions in astrobiology is, would we recognize the Earth as a habitable planet if we observed it when it was only one billion years ago, when we know, sorry, one billion years old, when we know that there was life on the Earth, in the ocean, but it was still largely carbon dioxide atmosphere? Would we recognize the Earth as a planet that has life on it? Uh, that's one of the challenges. But would we recognize Venus? Because there is very good evidence uh, now that Venus did in fact have surface liquid water oceans. So if we looked at uh, our, uh, our solar system as an alien civilization when our solar system was about 2 billion years old, for the Earth we'd be starting to see things like the rise of oxygen and the depth of life. But we would also conclude that there are two planets, Earth-sized planets in the system with surface liquid water. And this is extremely important because when we look at uh, exoplanets, terrestrial exoplanets, then we're not necessarily looking at them when they're four and a half million years old. We're looking at them at a variety of ages and they've been through all kinds of evolution to get to the point that we're seeing. And so this is something that's really important to keep in mind uh, because when we look at our solar system, when it's say 80 years old, then we're going to be looking at a very different picture again for all the planets in our solar system. Uh, so let me just run through what are the, what are the uh, major stumbling blocks in us being able to 
uh, to address this further for, uh, for Venus and Earth in our system. Now, one of these is the interior structure and composition uh, of Venus. There's very little that's known. You would think that Earth and Venus formed under similar conditions, and you'd probably be right. They probably have a similar size pool. We don't know for sure, although there's recent work from Jean-Luc Margot, who I believe gave the previous uh, Peel lecture, who's done some amazing work on this by using radar mapping of the surface to, to measure changes in the rotation rate. Uh, so that's important to know because when we're looking at planets around other stars, we can often try to infer their interior compositions from abundances of refractory elements like silicates and magnesium that are present in the star. There's usually one, uh, there's a one-to-one -one correlation approximately for the Earth and the Sun. That may be true elsewhere, but we need to figure that out for Venus. Uh, history of tectonics is a, is a big one um, because one of the key things may be that Venus lost the ability at some point to subduct um, uh, carbon from its atmosphere. Earth has more carbon than Venus, but it stores it away. Venus at some point may have reached a point, uh, a point where it had no way to store its carbon except for the atmosphere and no recourse from which to uh, transfer it back into the interior. That could be the key. Uh, the atmospheric chemistry of the Venetian atmosphere is still largely unknown, which makes it very difficult for us to run the climate models that Francois Forget was talking about. If there was water, where did it go? Which is a significant problem. Generally, you would be moving it up into the atmosphere and then disassociating it, whereby you'd lose the hydrogen, but then you've got a ton of oxygen. And so oxygenating the surface and maybe even subducting some of the oxygen uh, uh, processes that people are still trying to understand. And of course, as I mentioned, did Venus have a habitable period? And that's part of the processes that we're trying to understand now because having a, a surface liquid water ocean um, uh, for a planet like Venus uh, can have substantial effects on, on cloud formation and that may be a piece of the puzzle. So what I'm mentioning here, I'm throwing at you a whole bunch of pieces uh, that will come together towards a consistent planetary evolution model because the way in which I think about it is that uh, there are all kinds of factors as we saw in the planets a hard diagram. Some of them are major, some of them are minor. And we're trying to understand how to weight each of these when we're talking about uh, planets. Uh, because when we look at the difference between Venus and Earth, the traditional thinking has been, well, Venus is 30% closer to the Sun, it received twice the amount of solar energy, case closed, we can all go home. And that may be the answer. But you have to understand that there are many other differences. And one of the, one of the most important is the rotation rate. Venus is almost not quite, almost tidally locked to the sun. In fact, it rotates very slowly uh, backwards. Um, and the reason that's so important is because the climate models we have been able to produce for a planet like that shows that you tend to develop substantial clouds at the substellar point, meaning on the day side, which causes enormous uh, uh, increase in albedo. So you're reflecting much of that energy and you're still able to keep temperate conditions at the surface for a period of time when the sun was less luminous, which it was uh, earlier on in the solar system uh, history. So we also know that Venus has a negligible magnetic field. We're still not sure how important that is uh, because it's not clear if the atmospheric loss processes for Earth, for example, are advantageous because Earth has a dipole magnetic field and we get substantial atmospheric loss at the poles, for example. But we know that there are various uh, differences between uh, Venus and Earth, for example, uh, Venus may not have suffered a substantial moon forming impact, which had a profound effect on the, uh, the, the, the final water inventory uh, for the surface of the Earth. So uh, it could be that one of these processes is dominating, for example, the one I mentioned before, which is surface subduction. Because here's one way to think about it. If we were to assume for a moment 
that Venus and Earth did have similar starting conditions and that they had similar initial delivery of volatiles and so that you had two Earth-sized planets, both of which had surface liquid water oceans. Now, as I said, my Earth science colleagues are constantly reminding me, wow, isn't the Earth amazing? It's managed to be able to do this for four billion years. That's just so cool. And it is. How does it get away with this trick? Well, a, a, a common feeling about this is that it's because of the carbon cycle, that we have a temperature-controlled thermostat by which carbon is removed from the atmosphere and then subducted into the interior, a process that is moving through about 100,000 years and, like I said, it's temperature sensitive. Now, maybe the answer is that either you can subduct your carbon into the interior or you cannot. And if you can't, then you start to put all the carbon into the atmosphere. Because if that is the major process that is, uh, that is um, uh, moderating the surface conditions, then it could be that Venus and Earth represent a true dichotomy of terrestrial planet evolution. Either you can store your carbon in the interior, or you can't, and it goes in, in the atmosphere. Now, of course, that's dangerous. We have two objects in our sample. Why are we talking about dichotomies? This is where exoplanets come in, because exoplanets may reveal that there's actually a whole lot of outcomes. Um, and uh, many of them may be transitory, and so we might be seeing planets which are in temporary stages of evolution as they're on their way to a post-runaway greenhouse state. But this is, uh, in my opinion, the real power of exoplanets. The real power of exoplanets is a statistical sample which puts our solar system in context. So, um, uh, the way in which we're going to, one of the ways in which we're going to handle this going forward is trying to understand how we can distinguish between Venus and Earth analogs once we start getting data from James, uh, James Webb, but more likely future facilities that are more equipped to go down into that mass regime. But the requirements of this is that we need to be able to produce detailed pressure, temperature, composition, and chemistry profiles that extend from the top of the atmosphere where we'll be measuring these transmission spectra all the way down to the surface and understand how these vary with planetary properties such as the mass and the radius of the planet. This is really the key challenge. And so what I wanted to leave with is, is uh, what we're going to be doing go, going forward to try and uh, uh, understand this. And it's a two-pronged approach. One is, of course, the exoplanet strategy. And uh, you may have seen diagrams like this before with, with NASA's future plans for missions. Uh, I spoke about Kepler, we're now in the era of TESS, and with James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, W1st, which is now called uh, the, the Roman Telescope. Uh, and this is moving on to New World's Telescope, because this doesn't take into account the results of the recent Astro 2020 decadal, where it essentially smooshed these two things together uh, into, a, into a single mission. Uh, but it's very much promoting the idea of direct imaging. Uh, so that's the pathway that uh, exoplanet uh, uh, missions are going to be moving forward. We've got a parallel uh, track here from the European side. But all of this to say that this, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to continue to see a massive increase in the exoplanet inventory which, uh, and hopefully a, a, uh, a similar build-up with James Webb and other facilities of the atmospheric composition of these planets. At the moment, we only really have statistics about the numbers of exoplanets, their sizes, their masses, uh, their orbital properties. What we really need is a statistical sample of the atmospheric uh, composition, at least at the top of the atmospheres. But the great news is that um, uh, the middle of last year, uh, 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 the uh, NASA administrator delivered his state of NASA address and announced the result of the next discovery missions. Uh, there were four missions proposed, two of which were Venus, and uh, we were delighted to see that both missions selected were the Venus missions. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's an abundance of, of riches. And I'm very fortunate to be on uh, the science team for the Da Vinci probe uh, and a collaborator on the Veritas 
probe, as it's described here, Da Vinci will have a probe which will uh, drop down into the atmosphere all the way to making a soft landing on the surface. Uh, and it will indeed provide exactly what I mentioned before, which is a, a temperature, pressure, chemistry and composition profile uh, much more precise than anything we have available to us previously and allow us to model the Venetian type atmosphere and hopefully transitions of that atmosphere in ways that we can't presently do. Uh, the Veritas mission is essentially an extension of the Magellan mission uh, that I mentioned earlier. It will be uh, measuring the, the, the surface uh, topography at much higher precision uh, than Magellan was able to do. And so we'll be learning if Venus is currently outgassing, if it has subduction which is going on uh, at, at the surface. Uh, so just to, to end with why uh, uh, I, I, I believe this is such an important topic for planetary habitability. As I mentioned, terrestrial planets are extremely common uh, from, from what we have learned from Kepler. And so that could mean that there's a lot of post-runaway greenhouse states uh, out there. And we need to understand how these came about. Another point is that, as I said earlier, we didn't, we didn't fully appreciate uh, the extent of the, of the surface conditions of Venus until we went there. Uh, and one thing I, I sometimes have to remind people about, we're not sending a probe to Proxima Centauri B, you know, like by definition the nearest exoplanet. We're not going to have that data. The only data we will have will be right here in our solar system. And so whenever somebody says we, when it comes to habitability, we only have one data point, you should all be very upset at that because we do have more than one because knowing what the boundaries of habitability are, which is what Venus clearly represents, is just as important as knowing what's going on in the middle. Uh, and uh, Venus uh, could be a preview uh, into Earth's future. And this is why uh, understanding the relative factors uh, of uh, planetary habitability are so, so important. Because one of the things that's often said about Venus is that it represents the end state of, uh, of all terrestrial planet evolution. Because once you enter into a runaway greenhouse state, there's very little to do with the carbon. It's, it's more or less an irreversible state. And so that, that is uh, almost certainly um, the end state of Earth. It's not a question of if Earth will become Venus, it's a question of how or when. And that's going to be a result of these various knobs that we can turn. Uh, when Earth will start to lose the surface liquid water, when subduction will end, when Venus, Earth, sorry, when Earth will stop outgassing, and those are some of the models that we're working on right now to give a better estimate on when, through natural processes, not man-made processes, <laughs> when when the twins might be uh, reunited. So that'll be uh, an interesting thing to figure out. And so. Um, I do have the book of planetary habitability. I want to stress that, that this is not a shield. I don't get any royalties from this book, so I don't actually care if you buy it or not. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, we're all in the UC system and you should already have access to it because it's through IOV, which is the same uh, uh, company that uh, publishes WS Jones. Uh, so it's all available for you there. Uh, many of the, uh, uh, the white papers I, I carpet bombed, the decadal surveys with white papers about why studying Venus uh, as an exoplanet was so important. I had a review paper published recently about the connection between the solar system and exoplanetary science. So there's a lot more information there. But other than that, thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. the Earth's oceans to several oceans worth, then the pressure at the ocean floor 
uh, starts to produce a thick layer of ice. And the problem with that is that we start to shut down interaction between the, the ocean chemistry and, and the mantle. And uh, in particular, there are uh, various bioessential elements, like phosphorus in particular, which then get truncated in their, in their uh, participation in the biochemistry, which has been really important for biochemistry on, on Earth. Uh, so it, it does seem like uh, having too much of a good thing is actually a real possibility. And this is, this is really important for what I said earlier about architectures, uh, because uh, there's various conversations about the role Jupiter has played in the delivery of water to the inner solar system, in that it may have sent a lot of the uh, outer solar system icy material our way, uh, or that it may have uh, truncated it through, through impacts on, on, on Jupiter. But uh, the, the concern at the moment is that uh, if not having a Jupiter, like for example the Trappist system, um, uh, because the Trappist planets, our estimates of their bulk density is actually relatively low, which starts to indicate that they may be water rich. And if that's true, then it could mean that the Trappist planets are uninhabitable simply because they have too much water. But you know, this is something that, that so we'll find out because Trappist system is going to be uh, uh, just carpet bombed with JWST observations during cycle one. So hopefully we'll have some indication of that. Yeah. Um, I, I saw one of your earlier slides. Uh, I don't even know if uh, uh, Venus has a magnetic field, but is there ways of determining just maybe because they're so close that they would, other planets, exoplanets, would have a, a magnetic field? Yeah, so, uh, so the answer to your first part is Venus has a negative and magnetic field. Um, most of the measurements that have been made have just placed upper limits on the strength of the Venetian magnetic field. And we're not, still not quite sure why that is. We know it's a slow rotator, and insofar as it may or may not have a, an outer liquid core, uh, may be a part of that. But th this is uh, another aspect where I like to remind people about the axis of time because it doesn't presently have a magnetic field, but there are model, cooling models for Venus which show that it could have had it, an Earth like magnetic field uh, up until about a year ago. Um, now, the question is how important is that for planetary habitability, as, as, as many have argued about the protection uh, from ionizing radiation, uh, and, and would we be able to measure that for, for exoplanets? That's, that's one of the fundamental problems with, with magnetic fields, is that things like magnetic field, planetary rotation, features like that, which we're not sure, uh, rotation seems to be very important, we're not so sure about magnetic field, but, but both of those are quite inaccessible, at least in the short term, for exoplanets. The only measurements which have been made or attempts of measurements for magnetic fields or exoplanets essentially come from interactions of the planet with the star. So once again, we're looking at the star and trying to infer things about the exoplanet, uh, but that has only really proven to be effective for uh, hot Jupiters, so giant planets in, insofar as they may be inducing spots on the star. Uh, uh, there, there has also been some work using radio astronomy to try and detect magnetic fields because Jupiter has a very radio loud magnetic field. But, uh, but what's the that's just, just been for giant planets. Something like trying to measure the Earth's magnetic field from a distance of many parsecs is something which I don't think we'll be able to do any time soon. Do you have another question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are some of the more unusual effects of tidal locking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I had mentioned that um, for a tidally locked planet, uh, that you can uh, you can start to uh, get a lot of cloud formation on the day side of the planet, um, but for a planet like Venus, um, uh, then if you have a very very thick atmosphere, then the mass of the atmosphere is substantial enough that it can actually uh, result in annual momentum transfer between the atmosphere and the solar planet. Uh, which is which is really amazing. So uh, I the, I had a nature paper mentioned on the bottom 
the, the, the talks about the atmospheric dynamics, but this is also related to what uh, John Luke Mago published uh, last year in Nature as well, uh, where he was looking at the changes in the uh, in uh, Venus's rotation rate. Because one of the interesting things we found about Venus is that we know it slowly rotates backwards, but not at a constant rate. It's actually oscillating, and what we observe from the data from the Japanese Akatsuki uh, mission is that we see bow shocks in the atmosphere of Venus because you need to remember that the surface pressure is equivalent to one kilometer depth in the ocean. So this is enormous pressure that's, that is happening, this supercritical fluid that's interacting with the topography. So this bow shock is actually the atmosphere propagating on from interaction with an equatorial continent called Aphrodite Terra. And integrated over time, that is transferring annual momentum such that it's actually preventing Venus from being completely tidally locked. Because if you just do the raw calculations, Venus should have long since been tidally locked, but it isn't. And that's probably because of the interaction with, with, with the atmosphere. So it has those, those kinds of effects as well. Thank you. I just wanted to ask what the evidence was for liquid water in the past on Venus and how Da Vinci was going to resolve that mystery or what was that? I mean, you said there was liquid yeah. water in the past. Yes. But then there's clearly some question about if Da Vinci is going to do more. What's the truth? Yeah, so there's, a, there's a, a couple of pieces there. One is um, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. Uh, because a very high deuterium to hydrogen ratio is indicative of uh, vast amounts of water loss from the upper atmosphere. And there have been previous measurements of the TDH ratio of Venus, but they've been relatively inconsistent, but they've all been substantially uh, higher than we observe the Earth and other bodies in the solar system. So that's, that's one piece of, of evidence that needs to be verified and also as a function of altitude within the Venetian atmosphere. Um, uh, uh, another um, uh, piece of the evidence is that the climate models that, that have been run for Venus when, this, when the sun uh, was, uh, the luminosity was about a gig year ago, showed that you can, you can maintain surface liquid water up until that point. When you have the uh, cloud formation and subcellar point, you can remain cool enough. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of a, 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 a computational piece of evidence to say that it is consistent with, with, that, with that model. I should say that the flip side of that is that that assumes that you were able to condense surface liquid water in the first place. Because there are other models that show that if you don't condense it out of the atmosphere during the formation of Venus, then actually the water vapor, rather than forming clouds on the day side, will form clouds on the night side, which means you get this double whammy effect of this blanket plus a lack of reflectivity on the day side, and then you never have surface liquid water. So, so, the, so that is still very much a possibility. But the other piece is, is and this is this is a, a kind of a kind of a blank slate, and that is that the, the most of the surface, about 70 to 80 percent of the surface of Venus, is about the same age, about 780 years old, which we determined from crater crater counts larger. Um, the, the fact that it has a fairly consistent age over, over the surface uh, means that beyond that, uh, before that, that there, uh, that there could have been a series of events uh, that led to that. And uh, one model that's consistent with that is that that is, was actually the result of, of some massive water loss that occurred very rapidly and then left it in that state where it has relatively little subduction. Uh, Uh, so you said Da Vinci is going to land the soft landing. How long do we expect it to be operational on the surface? We're not sure. So we're, uh, our estimates uh, is about half an hour. Uh, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the veneer landers uh, last about one to two hours on the surface. Mind you, that's back in back in the eighties with the state of the art electronics available uh, then. Um, uh, I'll, I'll mention that one of the 
uh, interesting things I've seen at technology demonstrations at Venus meetings um, is that the uh, we can now do much better than that. We, we can survive for months and even years on the surface of Venus. Then there's even plans for a, a Venus rover, if you can imagine that. Um, but, but Da Vinci is, is uh, primarily uh, optimized, of course, for, for the atmospheric measurements and, it, and, and, uh, and so anything we get on the surface is for free. Uh, but, but it would be great if we could have a sustained presence. One of the, one of the key problems is, as I mentioned earlier, only 3% of the solar radiation reaches the surface. So it's not like you can just have solar panels like we would have, because that would be fairly effective. You need to have some other power source. We'll close with that. I just want you to come up and ask a question afterwards. Okay, thanks a lot.